Hi everyone, this is Mahabeli from the American University in Cairo and with me is Jasmina. Hi, I'm Jasmina Najah. I'm from the American University of Beirut. And today we are going to show you a liberating structure called 15% Solutions. Jasmina and I want to use it in a workshop, so we thought we'd also share it with you guys um, with potential ways of using it in class. Um, and so it's about discovering and focusing on what each person has the freedom and responsibility to do like right now. I think when there are huge problems, it's really helpful to think about what can I actually do without additional resources or time and that I have control over. Um, and it's again, it's a liberating structure. This is the link to it if you want to read more about it. And it's developed by Henry Lipmanovich and um, Keith McCandless. And it's inspired by a professor called Gareth Morgan. And the idea of it is the invitation is to ask people to think about a personal challenge or a team challenge, depending on the, point, the, you know, the context. What is your 15%? Where do you have discretion and freedom to act? And what can you do without more resources or authority? This makes a lot of sense in business contexts, I think, but in an educational context, Jasmina and I are thinking that either teachers can come together and thinking about a 15% solution to modify their course for next semester. So all of us are just ending a semester in the Northern hemisphere at least and starting a new one and thinking about what is something that is really easy for me to do right now that I have the authority to do, I'm allowed to do it. So not for example, crapping, scrapping grades because you don't probably have the control to do that, but whatever things you do have control to do. <laughs> um, and, and it's not something that you need a lot of resources to do. That's the first idea. Another idea I think would be really useful is in the middle of the semester, having students think about a 15% solution to modify your course. So, I mean, sometimes when you get mid-semester feedback from students, they want to change, but the change isn't really easy to implement. And this is about helping them think through what are some really small changes that if they made, if you made to your course, it would help them learn better or enjoy the course more. And then the third one, uh, and I think this one you can do at any time with students, is help them think about ways they can enhance their own learning. And then when they all do that and then they share, they get to learn from each other what each other's 15% solutions are so that it might actually inspire them to do more. So just me and I are going to go through it now. And usually you would um, think about, you know, trying to think about a small change sparked by one person that would make a big result. When you're the teacher, it makes a big difference in your students. When you're doing a multi-section course, it might be a small thing that you suggest and everyone in the multi-section course does. Um, and you can either do a very quick way of, in small groups, uh, let someone work on something alone for three minutes, and then as a group, discuss what you've written, and then debrief. Or you can do it in a larger way um, because then group members can provide consultations to each other. I think let's not do the long way. <laughs> let's do the short way. Just short and sweet. It. <laughs> yeah. So I've got slides here and you would have as many slides as you have students where they write their name and start brainstorming their 15% solutions on their own. Um, and then we would just come back together and share and present back to each other. So Jasmina, for now, um, are you good to, which one would you like to answer? Like a 15% change you'd make to your classes or? I think to my classes. Okay. And, and then you can focus your challenge. Like for me, I think the challenge is I want to reduce workload for myself and for my students without losing any of the learning outcomes. So I'm mm -hmm. going to focus on trying to do that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute myself. Um, and I'm going to start typing and I'm going to also show what you're typing at some point. <laughs> Okay, All right, am I going to be on top and you on the bottom or me on sure, the bottom and you on top? whatever. That kind of has connotations. But yeah, I can do the slide eight and you can do slide seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's do that.
for one more minute, Jasmine. Okay. Great. Okay, so now that each of us has written, um, do you want to go ahead and present yours? Yeah, so um, like in my case, I've never really been much of a fan of, you know, every single assignment having a particular grade. And I've always been more in favor of like, you know, assessing things through, let's say, an end of semester portfolio or opting for contract grading. Um, and at my institution, we have a rule that, let's say, by, you know, mid-semester, you have to present, you have to give students X percent of their grade, which kind of makes it a little bit more problematic to, like, opt for these different alternative uh, assessment options. So, um, I was thinking that I could kind of get around that by, you know, like, mid-semester just giving students like a progress report and telling them based on what you've been doing so far your expected grade is x which can obviously change by the end of the semester depending on uh, your effort and your uh, you know and the work that you uh, submit i was also thinking i'm very much into taking a kind of multimodal approach um, i teach writing academic writing and technical communication um, and I've, I have to, whether I like it or not, by the end of the semester, you, my students have to, you know, hand in um, a proper, you know, research paper with uh, full citation and what have you. Um, so it has to be a traditional typed paper. Um, so I thought, what can I do to kind of include all of this multimodal uh, goodness? So uh, in my case, I thought, yeah, I mean, within my control, I have control over the lower stakes assignments. So maybe instead of telling students to, um, you know, uh, regularly submit what their research question is, let them present it in a podcast. If let's say um, I want them, um, you know, uh, to do their, their annotated bibliography, maybe um, have them do it in a more visual manner. So there are ways of kind of including, I think, these multimodal, um, you know, approaches um, that kind of build up towards the research paper while sticking to the fact that I have to make sure they produce a research paper. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think one of the things you forget when we teach students about research papers is that, yes, people do research papers and then they present them in conferences or then they make a documentary. Out of them. Like there's there's so much else you want out of a research paper other than the written part. And we don't teach that other part so much. Yeah. Uh, it'll get it more read or more, uh, you know, the knowledge in it will spread faster if you're offering it in these other formats and, you know, all these famous people who write books and they do podcasts about them, right? Or they, you know, what that kind of thing. So it makes a lot of sense to me. Very true. And even mind mapping. I mean, there's so much that you right, can like do with, with it. With literature, that, yeah. like with this, the part that you were saying about uh, bibliography, you can do a mind map of that. And that could actually make a lot of sense. And it's actually going to help them towards their research. Like the process itself doesn't have to be mm -hmm. textbook a lot of sense because not always linear i'll go back and ask you about contract reading after we finish um, mm -hmm. all right so my uh, challenge was mainly i want a 15 percent solution that reduces workload for me and for students and some of the things i think i'll do is one of the things that really bothers me with student reflection is i try to explain to them the idea of reflecting on what they learned and how to apply it and so what and future how, what are they going to do differently and so on um, but a lot of times, and I don't give them a word count usually. So what ends up happening sometimes is that they think that if they write more, it's going to be better. And they just write a lot of crap, uh, like just filler, fillers. And so I thought of this thing where I, there, 
I give them what, what I'm calling 100 word stories. This is one of my friends who does a lot of this. And there's a few people who do these things. First of all, calling it a story reminds them that it has to be personal a little bit. So it's not about writing in academic ways. They're blogging it and they're writing their own story. Um, but if they have the 100 word limit, I'm thinking they're going to focus. <laughs> and also, whatever it is, even if it is not very focused or whatever, I just have to read 100 words. <laughs> And you can read so many more and so much faster. And it, it might encourage them to read each other's. I'm just realizing this now as I say this. They might read each other's more often. It might be easier to say, go read a couple people's blogs because you know they're only 100 words each. Um, Even it's a great way to teach them how to summarize their thoughts. That's true. Summarize and say something. Yeah, that's a great point. It has a lot of benefits, actually, more than I imagined when I first wrote it. And then the other thing that I could do sometimes when something doesn't really lend itself to storying um, instead of asking them to write the reflection free form, I could ask them to do like a minute paper, but take it through a Google form. So the minute paper is just what's the most important thing you learned, what questions remain in mind. And that's often what I want to know if it's just one of those things. And then they submit it either like at the beginning of a class or just before class starts. And I think having it submitted at the beginning of the class will feel like less of an assignment to them, even though it's actually the same thing. And I could give it to them earlier if someone wants to take more time to fill it, but it's due like five minutes after class starts. And so that, that gives me a quick overview of where they are, uh, but also feels like less for them. And it's all in one place, which is that Google form. And so I think that might, but I, I always feel like I want to add a question to the minute paper that's different from just these two questions. So I think it's fine. So it's a five minute paper, whatever. But still, like, I hope that will feel like just I think even calling it like a five minute paper will feel like it's not a lot of work. Whereas sometimes uh, something does need more time from students and then I can tell they've done it in five minutes and that's not good. So this is kind of like a signal to them that this is the kind of thing where you don't have to take a lot of time to answer it. But hopefully they've taken the time to read <laughs> or do the or watch the video or whatever I've assigned them. So those are my ideas. I think that I think this could have a lot of benefit. I think when faculty do it together, like to get ideas from each other. Right? Definitely, there's there's a lot to be you know uh, gained when people exchange ideas. That's for sure. And I'm sure if students start thinking about, I think the kinds of things they're struggling with with the pandemic, it's like how to motivate themselves, how to handle deadlines, and how to handle workload. And I've seen some things. My students and I talk about these things, and sometimes they come up with things that are really helpful. Things like just. You know, if you can go outdoors a little bit, do some of your classes outdoors, or if you just get dressed in the morning, that kind of difference that it makes, or rewarding yourself with like a phone call to a friend, or things like that, that they, they come up with themselves, uh, can be really helpful to other people as well. Um, yeah, I think we've sort of harvested some ideas. I think if we had a shared project, like we were all teaching a multi-section course, we could all agree, oh, these three ideas are the ones we're all gonna try, for example. But obviously, if people are just doing individual stuff, then they can just make those individual decisions together. Then there's this slide that says a small change suggested by individual could potentially spark a big result because the individual doesn't always have to be you. It could be someone else who suggested it, but it's uh, something to do with it. Do you have any other reflections on this, um, on other ways you could use this or ways you could do it differently? So I see that this could potentially be used alongside maybe Troika or Wise Crowds. I can definitely, you know, see that happening. Um, and um, as you mentioned, I mean, it is definitely, I think, like my students do a lot of group work. And I think they can probably benefit, like if they're having a problem with the group dynamic or whatever, maybe taking a step back and trying this 15% you know, a solution sort of approach to kind of iron out, you know, whatever issues they're having with their group work or their research challenges even. Makes a lot of sense. I think I just sometimes don't stop and think of what's something quick that I could do that might help. Um, I worry a little bit that some things might be more structural issues and trying to just give a 50% solution might be like sort of glossing over it. But at the same time, I'm also the kind of person who likes to take action quickly. <laughs> and so I think it matters that you start off and doesn't mean that you never go back and do some other liberating structure or some other way of thinking through a problem uh, more deeply. Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the start. And just getting 
something going because I think a lot of times they're just overwhelmed by all the problems and thinking none of the solutions are going to work and I'm sure there's and I, something. yeah yeah and I also think that many of us we feel that we have so many maybe restrictions on let's say how we can approach our courses or what we need to achieve or or even students they feel that they have no freedom or they have no ownership over certain things and I and I feel even I mean just the concept of telling people within your resources within your power there is actually a lot that you can achieve I think it sends a very positive and constructive kind of message right so so recognizing what power you have indeed and how you can use it that's that's really true because sometimes there are solutions that don't involve you but there might be other solutions that are smaller that you could do even though within the, I mean, like what you were saying about uh, the grading thing is you still have to give that mid-semester grade thing but you're not you're not going to count it you're going to do it in some other way the progress report makes sure students know where they stand but not in the way that your institution probably imagines that you're doing it and i do something kind of similar as well. okay i'm going to stop this video and we'll leave the resources along with this um,